Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Vianney Lubis, Vice President of NextGen Collective, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to our event today, featuring a very special conversation with our special guest, Moises Zamora, and hosted in collaboration with our wonderful partners at Bank of America, whom I first want to formally thank for their longstanding partnership and their unwavering commitment that they make to impacting and elevating the Latinx community. Next Gen Collective truly would not be the brand or network that we are today without your endorsement and support. So thank you so much. Now, before we get started, I do wanna quickly share a few housekeeping notes. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties whatsoever, please just go ahead and use the help chat for support. It's just located on the top right-hand panel. One more thing, we are going to have the opportunity to ask your questions to Moises here today. So please feel free to enter your questions at any time during the program today using the Q&A box, which again is located on the top right-hand panel. So now, Back to today's programming, why you're all here and for the good stuff. This particular Next Gen Collective event is very special to us, and that's because we are commemorating the visibility issue of our parent brand of Hispanic executives. And it's a very special issue to all of us. We're so proud of it because it highlights and places a spotlight on Latino, LGBTQ+, and immigrantes communities. So two communities that are often overlooked by mainstream media and certainly deserve to be seen, heard, and celebrated always. So we were so thrilled to feature and work with Moises for this issue. He is the creator, co-showrunner, and executive producer for the hit Netflix show, Selena, the series. He's had an incredibly fascinating journey in Hollywood so far, clearly a force to be reckoned with. Thank you, Moises, for joining us today and for sharing your experiences with our audience. We're big fans and so honored you took the time out of what is surely a very, very busy schedule to be with us today. So thank you. Uh, we're also joined today by two Bank of America executives. Julia Piu is a senior vice president of wholesale credit strategy process and design, and Luis Villadiego, who is the senior vice president and head of human resources in Ireland, one of my favorite countries to visit. And folks, it's 10 p.m. in Ireland right now. So Luis, thank you so much for staying up with us. Now, Luis will be interviewing Moises, and after their discussion, we are going to break into lounge rooms that will allow you all to network with the speakers and with your fellow Latinx peers. We want you to use this opportunity to get to know each other and to meet. So on that note, let's get started. I'm so happy to introduce you to Julia. Julia, the floor is yours. I'll be back to close. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, and welcome everyone. I'm Julia Pugh, and as uh, as she said, I'm the wholesale credit strategy process design exec, supporting all of our global banking and markets credit teams at Bank of America. I'm also uh, on the bank's Hispanic Latino Executive Council, the LGBT Executive Council, and I participate in the bank's Disability Action Network. At, at Bank of America, we have 11 different employee net networks, which are formal company supported groups made up of employees who sh share a common identity. Uh, along with those associates who support them. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself and explain my affinity to those three networks and why I have such a commitment to diversity. I currently live in Charlotte, North Carolina with my wife and uh, Dawn of nine years. She's a realtor uh, and we're both federal club members with the Human Rights Campaign. We have two adorable six-year-old twins, a son named Finnegan, uh, who we call Finn, and a daughter named Aurora, who we call Rory. Uh, when the twins were three, they were also diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So my wife and I have also become enthusiastic disability advocates, and we do all we can to ensure that neurodiversity is better understood and accepted. And I think that begins uh, with, with visibility. Uh, in addition, I'm also the daughter of a Puerto Rican mother who didn't know how to speak English on her first day of public school and a white non-Spanish speaking father. So as a result, none of my siblings speak Spanish, uh, including me. Uh, growing up, I lived in a rural uh, farming community in Michigan, and during the week I attended a small all-white public school 
Uh, but on the weekends, we drove 45 minutes to my grandparents' home, which was located in a more urban, uh, largely Hispanic area. There I'd play with cousins who, like me, only spoke English, uh, despite having at least one uh, Spanish-speaking parent. Uh, and I have fond memories uh, of those days with my grandfather playing dominoes with friends, uh, you know, attending mass with my grandparents and, and dropping my grandmother uh, off to play bingo. Um, but it was such a different experience from the one I had at home with my father's side of the family. And even before my parents divorced, I remembered feeling like I was really living in two very different worlds. I also knew early on that I was gay. And while most of my family knew as well, it wasn't something that I was openly discussed. Uh, or ever discussed. Uh, my romantic interests were always welcome in the home, but they were often introduced as Julia's friend or Julia's special friend. So my experiences growing up led me to compartmentalize a lot of different aspects of my life. And as a young adult, and really for a considerable time, uh, I was very deliberate about the aspects of myself that I would share with others, especially at work. When I first met my wife 12 years ago, I learned that she had attended her high school prom uh, with her then girlfriend. And unlike me, Dawn had a very distinct coming out moment and thereafter live in, lived her life, you know, really openly and authentically, uh, no matter what the situation was or, or who the audience. And so I was really inspired by her courage and openness. And I soon learned that she wasn't really going to accept anything less from me. And so I began to try and really bring all of my experiences forward and everything that I did. Um, and it was pretty hard. Uh, and sometimes being the introvert that I am, it's still very hard. But gradually, it's become really liberating. And in hindsight, uh, I don't think I ever realized how much energy uh, that it actually took um, to 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 sort of um, you know sort of keep everything compartmentalized. Um, uh, and now I think I'm on a similar journey with respect to my kids as they grow and develop. I want them to feel comfortable uh, bringing their authentic selves to all of their experiences. And I think that visibility and understanding eventually leads to inclusion and acceptance. And so. Uh, I think it's really important to to have the conversations that we're going to have, and diversity is just an incredibly important topic to me. And I'm so excited to be one of your co-hosts tonight, and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion uh, as well as the breakout session. So I want to just thank you all for being here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Luis Villadiego, and, and our guest, Mois Zamora. Hello. Hello. How are you? This window. <laughs> so good to see you again, Moises. And again, everyone um, who's out there watching us, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it is 10 p.m. here, but listen, it's okay. Um, and just a little side note, um, we're having a heat wave here, and there is no air conditioning in Ireland, so I'm just going to motor through. So if I look a bit shiny, please forgive me. But Moises, thank you uh, so much for, um, for um, you know, spending time with me here today. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to get right into it. And for those who are watching and listening, um, you know, they're in the virtual world, you know, start thinking about your questions and get those onto the Q&A, um, you know, uh, box or chat window and, and make sure that we're going to have time to get those questions answered. So let's get right into it. And, and also, you know, I, I did want to say again, thank you for telling Selena's story again in such a beautiful and authentic way. For me, it, you know, especially during lockdown, it was one of those lifting moments. And I just, I'm so appreciative that you were able to, to tell that story the way that you did. But um, let's start about your background, Moises. So um, growing up in Jalisco, Mexico, um, and then moving to California, you were the, the only son of a, the town doctor, and you didn't always feel like you, um, you, you fit in. Um, and then how did your childhood shape who you are, especially as a gay man? Um, will you talk to us about that? Uh, well, thank you for having me, and thank you for that question. Right, right, we're getting right into it. <laughs> How did you become who you were? Well, you know what? Look, um, I was growing. I grew up in a small town in Mexico, Limon, Jalisco. My dad had uh, established his practice there after medical school and marrying my mom. So I grew up, you know, always surrounded with lots of stories. You know, since the clinic was there, my dad pretty much was like the town doctor in this rural area and his specialty was delivering babies. We had pregnant ladies everywhere. Uh, there was one pregnant lady that gave birth in the back patio. My job was to bury placentas in the back, you know, backyard. So it was always really fascinating to go back to school and tell my friends all the things that happened um, at home. But I, one of the things that was very, um, you know, uh, that, really soon kind of struggled with is that I was kind of, you know, I was a sissy boy. I was like not into sports, not into the horses, not into the ranch life. 
And so that was really problematic growing up because I was, you know, always being trying to shape into something I wasn't. Um, and, you know, I think my way of sort of shrouding that is by be being a good student, getting, you know, perfect grades and, and all that, you know, transitioned all the way to um, us moving to California when I was 11 years old and leaving all of that behind, um, entering seventh grade in America, you know, uh, having, you know, speaking zero English, um, all that kind of became even other ways, had to find other ways to sort of layer in that identity um, and continue to be a good student, but uh, also afraid of who I really was. And and I think, you know, it's just, um, when you get, when you have to uh, get creative with your identity and who you are, I think um, it explains why a lot of gay men are in the creative fields. You know, you get to tell stories, you know, almost have to build worlds um, that sort of make sense for you. Um, and I've always been attracted to storytelling. Um, I put up like plays in high school. And after that, um, even though I was, I thought I was going to be a doctor, I ended up just really falling in love with literature and creative writing. And, and it was in college that I made the decision to be a, a writer. That really is amazing, and I like how you you know the, you, you talk about storytelling, and um, we'll talk about that you know later. But I just think it's so important that today, and especially today, uh, especially in the corporate world, you have to tell stories to communicate. And I think that is something that is a skill that so many people um, need to harness. And I'm so glad that you talk about it that way. It's about storytelling. And, and right now, it feels like you're telling me a story. I, I feel like I was taken back to you as a kid when you're working, you know, um, your dad and, and what he does um, for a living. You know, I was reflecting on when we talked to the day about um, you trying to find a circle of people, and there are not many people, you know, gay Latino writers, uh, but you found a group of writers that you that you connected with. And I'm so I, I love the mantra that you use that love first and be excellent. Yeah, talk to, yeah. talk to more about that. You know, I I I think I, if for all those people know that it's in a lot of industries, it's no, uh, it's not a secret that there's very little Latinx representation, and especially in front and behind the cameras in the entertainment industry. Yeah. But when I broke into television, um, I found myself being a very, you know, a very one of the few. Uh, not just Latinx writers, but also gay Latinx writers. And so when I, in a, at a meeting, at a conference with WGA, I found that there were a few of us around there. And, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to find community within the gay community, and especially for, you know, people of color. And so I, I felt that I needed this kind of fellowship because it's very lonely already uh, to be trying to do this in this in this you know, really harsh industry. I, I, you know, my parents are immigrants. I didn't have like Hollywood, you know, people that I could connect to or an uncle that I could talk to. And so it was really important for me to create this fellowship. And I brought as many as uh, gay Latinx screenwriters that I could find. And we started this group called the Clubhouse of Writers. And, um, and we, you know, basically at first it was a support group because uh, we needed to just identify what we were dealing with, you know, on our own. And sometimes we're pitted against the same jobs. And later it just became like a true friendship in the, with these people. And, you know, I when I invited them in that email, it's, I did have those kind of fight club rules. You know, the first rule is to really love one another, to really take an interest personally, because you don't care about someone's professional career if you're not, if you're not making a connection. This is beyond a networking group. This is like, find your friends, you know? And then the second one, just be excellent. Work on your craft, be dedicated to that. Because we always, no matter what, you know, like, you know, the, the work has to come in first. We have to excel at that. Yeah, that, I think that um, transcends across anything. Right. And I think that should be the mantra about what is diversity, love first and then be excellent um, in, in whatever it is that you want to do. So I think, you know, that was so, that was, I, I reflect on that quite a bit. Um, and that kind of takes us to, you know, um, you mentioned in your article that you didn't have a ton of experience prior to Selena, but you were approached with this and you, and you said, I'm not saying no. So, you know, you know, how, how did you get there and, and how did you, you know, how did you persevere? Um, you know, did you feel that you were, you had this imposter syndrome? Um, did you feel that you needed to kind of maybe fake it until you make it? You know, t talk to us about that journey. Well, you know, before that, I have to contextualize that after college, in, in deciding to be a writer, um, the first track was to be a novelist. And ironically, at that time, um, 
I kind of, which is it's still kind of happening right now. I didn't really see a lot of examples of ex Mexican Americans or immigrants really succeeding in the publishing world, you know, and all the people that I kind of loved uh, or admired were like Latin American writers. So I thought like, I'm going to write a Spanish language novel, which led to really focusing on that. Um, however, so I've always been a writer. I've always, you know, got, got published, got a literary award, was a validation. But uh, when I started uh, to look into screenwriting as a transition, because my book, while, you know, it was successful, it was still like a lot of work for very little sort of outreach when it came to an audience. And I thought, okay, well, I'm in LA. You know, I love films. I, I used to make short films in college too. This is another way of storytelling. Um, I want to be able to share those stories to express myself, to reach more of an audience, more people. And so I went back to school, a lot of screenwriting courses. And what really just, I think, made it made a difference in my life is that I've always kept on writing. It's not like, you know, I went overnight. I've had like 20 years of writing experience. I kept writing books and everything. You know. It was just the, the format of screenwriter that I need to sort of master. But, um, you know, after two years of being in the TV industry and being given the opportunity by John Reilly on American Crime, the third season, I realized that if you really want to make a difference, if you really want to sort of stand out as a writer, um, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be a producer. You have to think outside of the box. Um, the, you know, the paradigms right now in entertainment or the institutions or those sort of paths sometimes are not um, the best ways for someone that is a gay Mexican immigrant to sort of thrive in, right? It, it's all relationship based. So what I did, I put on my, you know, my producer hat, my entrepreneurial hat, and I started looking for stories for IP. You know, I got the life rights to the world's youngest psychologist, which happens to be this Mexican genius girl that 13 year olds has a psychology degree, speaks five languages. So when I reached that, you know, that family, I got the rights to make a TV series with that. My agents started paying attention. And that's when they're like, okay, this guy is a producer. This was a creator. This one's not just getting a writer for hire. So they set me up with the producers that had the relationship and the rights with the Quintanilla family and the state. Um, and they were like, you know what, you know, Moses might be a good sort of person to, um, to pitch for them. And it was a general meeting and, you know, I prepared so much because Selena, as we all know for Mexican Americans, for Latinos in the U S it's like iconic. And I just couldn't believe that this opportunity was available to me and worse. I couldn't believe they hadn't found a writer yet. Um, and to me, it's such an inspirational, um, like Mexican American dream, um, that I did a lot of work prior to that meeting. And when I came in, I basically had already the vision for the entire two seasons, uh, of the show. And they were really impressed because I had done not just a lot of research, but I knew the kind of tone that I wanted to address. I wanted it to be wholesome, family oriented inspirational, you know, to just not necessarily focus on the tragedy of it all, but just like why she's so important to the Mexican American community and Latinos everywhere, you know, like I want, I wanted her to be an inspirational story and her story and they really loved my take. Um, I had to pitch to the family's lawyer and then the family, um, Christy, and that was really nerve wracking. And of course, Ibrahim Quintanilla was correcting me every like half minute that like, oh, that wasn't right. That's not right. You know, but but at the end of the day, they really loved my take and they really loved the approach because, um, you know, it's a family story and that's how you know, they started. So. Um, they they accepted the vision and then Netflix, knowing that, you know, a writer was attached, that the family had approved of that vision, you know, they saw, they bought the show right up. You know, we didn't even get to uh, take it out to other buyers. So it, it, it actually, it happened rather quickly. I can't imagine what it is to you know, put that story together. I thrive to be a good writer. It's not my strong suit, but I just <laughs> love, even in, in, in the series, how you even brought Suzette an AB story. Uh, in the movie, I, I think Selena definitely and the dad were the, the core, but you really told the entire story. And when you talk about family, but you really heard Suzette's point of view, you heard AB's point of view when he's off trying to find a producer or a songwriter for, you know, the crossover album, which I thought, you know, that was, you know, that was a new layer of Selena's story that I had not yet known. So I really, yeah, I love the way that you, you told that story. 
Um, I'm going to flip back a little bit to more around, um, you know, your role as as a visible leader, and why is it important? At you know, myself included, I make it a point, and Julia herself, we make it a point is there are not that many of us when we get to a certain part of you know of the pyramid, and it is lonely. And sometimes, you know, we feel like we have to be, you know, the poster child, whatever, because we have to kind of carry it. But I will still keep fighting because I want to make sure that people look up and see people um, like me. I'm proud that my name is Luis Villadiego, working in a very corporate um, of world. So, you know, I speak Spanish. My, I was, I was, you know, insist my grand, my parents made me speak Spanish. But um, talk about why that's important. And, and I love the fact that, you know, you, you, you speak openly about that. I think it's, it is so incredible. Well, I think one of the things that I learned and, you know, going back to, you know, hiring the writers for this, I it was a fully Latinx room with all the experiences because I have the mindset of growth. And I believe that in order to be a great leader, you also have to be willing to learn in the process that you may not have all the answers. And I think that gave me confidence to, with the little of, um, you know, experience that I had to be the leader that my room needed, that the show needed. And, you know, of course, I've been in the corporate world. I wasn't advertising before this. So that kind of allowed me to manage teams and so forth. But as far as like front phasing, I also knew that I was going to be a handful of lines for showrunners out there and that it was really, really vital to be as authentic as possible as who I was, to not deny that I was a Mexican immigrant, that I was, not, you know, English is my second language, that I, I'm gay and that I am in a relationship with a man, you know, that I have a cat, you know, all that is important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, you know, we're growing up and, you know, um, my parents don't, didn't, you know, when I was telling them I'm a writer, I'm a novelist, I'm this, I'm that, they just, as immigrant parents, they sacrifice so much for us to have a future, to have a career. So they understand doctor, they understand lawyer, but they don't understand artist. And there's no there's no degree. I mean, yes, you can get an MFA, but that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna be successful in the profession that you have picked. So it was all like an education for them and it was all really stressful. Now, of course, when they see your name, my name on the TV, <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, I always knew along. And the best thing they could do is they're not, they weren't perfect parents. They didn't yeah. understand me, but they always were there for me. Like if I needed rent money, they were there. It's like, I don't understand why you just don't get a job here or there. You know, uh, you can use, you can continue using this as a hobby. And I'm like, no, this is my profession. This is my calling. And, um, and I think that has allowed me to just keep that sort of like focus on I am a writer and I will continue to be a writer and everything that I do needs to be that. And now that I've achieved my dream, um, well, what happens, right? You achieve more dreams? No, you pass it on. You allow other people to achieve those dreams. So being a leader out there and being authentic and being able to share how I came up is important so other people you know can reach out so the circle you know you know we rise together so i you know if i have the opportunity to give somebody that break i'm gonna do that because there's not that many of us and we yeah. and it's sometimes you know maybe in a generation ago we we're all competing for the same slots but now i think that everyone is unique has a unique experience and we don't have to compete with each other we all have something to offer and i think it's you know to me is I try to help as many as Latinx creators, writers, or whoever, you know, get there, you know, within my own sort of limitations, of course. But but I think it's important to be that person, to be honest and authentic. It got me this far. So if something's worth <laughs> Exactly. And own it, own yourself and just really know what you what your what your gift is to the world. And so <laughs> and I love too how you learn you're a creative writer first, but then you're also a business person. And so you it wasn't what you pursued, but you figured out is how do I make a business out of it as well? So you, so you got to have to, you know, uh, balance both those as yeah, well. So, um, so, so, so what up to now professionally, what's next, you know, what projects are you involved with and, um, and, um, where, and where would you like to go? Well, you know, after Selena being a creator, being a showrunner, I learned, you know, exponentially what that was, but I also wanted to take that opportunity to leverage everything that I've accomplished so far and actually take another big jump. You know, everyone is like always telling me, don't take that so many big jumps. And I'm like, why not? <laughs> so far it's working. <laughs> and so I started my production company in order to have a, more control on the stories I want to put out there. 
you know, and and if you know until you know I lose power or nobody really pays attention to me. But right now, it was really really important to like sort of like keep on going, telling authentic Latinx stories. So my company, along with the Bianca Quesada, an incredible executive from East LA, actually, uh, and also a queer brown woman, um, we are. Our mission is to create, produce authentic stories about people of Latin American, indigenous, and Afro-Latino descent. And, you know, but also with an, having in mind that, that they need to have a commercial appeal. They need to be universal. You know, we don't want to just stuck in a niche. We, we want to make the case that our stories are universal, that the whole world can enjoy. And Selena is a testament to that. So let's keep on doing that. And so in the next two shows that we've sold, yay. Um, one is, we sold it to HBO Max and it's been announced and it's uh, titled Whistleblower. And it's going to tell the story, that really heartbreaking tragedy of the Fort Hood soldier, Vanessa Guillen, and her family, and how this Mexican-American soldier with, you know, with the hopes of achieving this American dream was just like, you know, uh, ended up being murdered because out of neglect, out of out of the criminality that happens in our, in the U.S. Army. And we're really excited about it. We have the rights. We're currently working on that. And then we have another really fun Fast and Furious Latino sort of like story that um, that takes place in Philadelphia, and that's that's uh, that's being developed at Disney. So we're we're you know we're all over the place as far as genre is concerned. We also have a horror, so we're just excited that to be given the opportunity to be able to tell these stories in a very authentic way. That is so amazing. I, I think you probably know that you are a pretty big deal. Like how does that? Feel? <laughs> I don't. You know, my mom doesn't think so. He's like, "Mijo, you're always gonna be my Mijo." I don't care. <laughs> I'm like, "Well, mom." <laughs> that is so true. That's what Latina mom is for us. She uh, yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen, let's do something fun here. Let's go with some rapid fire questions, and um, I want you to answer these like in one sentence or less. And so um, we'll, we'll keep this fun. So the first one is, "What is your favorite Selena song?" My favorite one is See Una Vez, but I did have Bitty Bitty Bomb Bomb as my 7 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning um, alarm for two years to get me excited. So I don't know if that answers that question. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, mine is um, um, Buenos Amigos, but, or, but I love all of them. You know, it's definitely yeah. some of my, you know, depending on my mood, sometimes what I play, you know, when I'm doing tours around the house, but it, it just it takes, me, takes me home. Name an actor or an actress you're dying to work with. And maybe even tell us if you are working with them. Oh my God, Sama Hayek. Um, oh my God. I really want her. And she really loves the, uh, you know, she's been involved in the Vanessa Guillem story and I would love for her to play the mom. So it's a lot of convincing I have to do, but uh, I think she's just, it, it's just, I want, I, I love her acting in Spanish, um, yeah. just maybe because like I grew up with her, um, yeah. not with her literally, but you know, <laughs> seeing her. Like, exactly. But yeah, Sama Hayek. Yes, no, she's amazing. What is your favorite film? You know, this one, it was a tough one because I'm all over the map. I like rom-coms and like really artistic ones. But the one that I always go to to make me feel and to be reminded that art is, can do the impossible is The Lives of Others. And that is a foreign language film from like about 15 years ago. And if you haven't seen it, oh, my God, it's one of the oh, incredible. It's like one of the best movies that really makes the case that art can change hearts. Oh, I just wrote it down, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up. Lives of others. Yeah, exactly. In German. And, uh, and um, uh, during long time, whatever. Uh, what's the last show you binge watched? I binge watched Never Have I Ever. <laughs> I saw that the other day. I didn't look that up. <laughs> Um, I think they're doing such a fantastic job with, you know, showing uh, YA people of, you know, color, like suffering through high school. <laughs> and, and then and the next one is like, what's on your bucket list? That one, that one big goal. You know, uh, one of the big things that I, uh, that I always wanted to do is publish a novel in English. Um, my novels, all the books I've written have been in Spanish. And I think that fear of like, I'm not good enough to write in English. I've overcome that. And I, I think I'm ready to do that. I want to, oh, no. yeah. and as well, like visit the world. I love traveling. It just rejuvenates my spirit. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited. Things are opening up here. I'm going to Mykonos in a couple of weeks and I'm just so ready oh, to do it again. Well, listen, now is the fun part. We're going to get to hear from you out there and um, you know, you can put your questions on the Q and A. And then we're going to start, um, you know, answering, or Moise is going to answer those questions. All right. So very interactive part. So let's see here. 
Um, we have one question here um, from Maryam Campos. What is your advice for upcoming producers, filmmakers, working to tell the stories of our communities that need funding and investments to make it possible? Well, I think one of the things that is really exciting about now is that there are more like us, not just, you know, in the producer films, stuff like that, but I, I've actually met Latinos in, in uh, venture capitalist uh, structures, like they're looking to help, you know, uh, narrative storytelling. I'm in conversations with someone that has cryptocurrency, Latina, doing like all that great stuff that is interested in funding independent filmmaking. So I'd say first worry about that script, make sure it's really good. <laughs> and then um, I think there, there's it's an exciting time right now that, um, that, that, that there's a lot of people out there that are looking forward to fund this um, filmmaking. And TV is a little different. You can't, it's just for independent filmmaking. I mean, in TV, it's really hard to be independent because you really depend on a platform or a network to buy your stuff. So there are, it's a completely different path. But I think that independent filmmaking is really exciting right now because the streamers are dying for more content. Very good. And then again, I'm learning the business, you know, it's impressive. So we have another question here from Christina Merrill. I like this question, actually. Um, um, what new things about Selena did you learn when creating the show? Did you learn anything about her that hadn't really been widely known before the show came out? Well, you know, I, we went into a really deep dive. We did a lot of research. We even had... Um, uh, we did some research in like libraries of like things that are not available online. And one of the things that I did learn is just like how much she valued education. And and I kind of knew a little bit about it, but you know, she went out of her way to get those degrees, to really learn, to become a to get a business degree. You know, she did that on, you know, not online, but through uh, you know, correspondence books after after graduating from high school, she got a degree in, 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 in for her, even though she was so successful as a singer and, you know, eventually as she opened up for boutiques, she really cared about education. And it just goes to the heart of a lot of like Latino families is like education is important and it was really yeah. valuable for her. And, um, and that's, you know, a lot of the details that I learned um, also from the family were really wonderful. We couldn't put everything up there. Uh, because we were, you know, had a limited amount of episodes, but um, it's just um, I did realize that the family had so much in her making, you know, yeah. from the, you know, AB and and, her, and making the music and Suzette being the kind of the best friend that she needed throughout. It was it was just it just reminded that like families are. You know, Latino families are really close um, and it's part of our value system. And um, and that was just wonderful to discover, or at least to get it confirmed, you know? Yeah, we're waiting for more questions, but I remember um, one of the things that I loved was when you uh, put in the show, the interview that she did on um, the Veronica Castro show, um, where she wasn't ready to announce her relationship with um, with Chris. Um, and it was, and I went to YouTube and, and, and I looked it up and it was such a wonderful way to depict that but you know that was something that i also you know, yeah and especially because when we did the research we were kind of added it up and i'm like wait she was already married to him like why is she not acknowledging it like so there was definitely sort of a pressure to keep that mystery of like she's single and stuff like that and and of course abraham and suzette kind of confirmed that like they didn't want it you know they're Selena learned not to be so public with her privacy. And I think that's why we all sort of project a lot onto her because she didn't share so much her privacy. We didn't, of course, venture into, you know, the fact that she was very religious. She was Jehovah Witness. Um, because again, the family wanted to kind of respect that and, and sort of, you know, just show that artist's persona but not all those little details. And, you know, I, I, it's a known fact that she was, but, but you know, it was, it, it, we couldn't even put that up there because they also wanted to create kind of a universal sort of um, bridge, you know, with her fans or continue to, especially for the new fans, you know. Exactly, exactly. Um, I got some more questions here now. Have you had mentors or sponsors that have helped, that helped pave the way for you to accomplish your goals, um, you know, personally and, and professionally? 100%. Um, I think they all show up uh, throughout your career. Uh, if someone is asking you how you doing, 
um, in your career or just shows any kind of interest, they, they're already your mentor. They're all your, your sponsor because, you know, sometimes you need them. Again, I can't go to my parents and be like, okay, what do I do about this TV show? What do I do about this? You know, you need to seek out. There's a particularly a couple of them, Greg Ross and Stephanie Ross, and they're TV producers that um, they really have been sort of, I call them my art parents because the older couple, they've been in the business forever. I always talk to them about like, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And then, you know, they, they sort of help me out, at least, you know, express myself with my issues and I get to my own conclusions. But it's really, really important to seek them out and, you know, you know have those relationships because sometimes it gets confusing. Um, and also it's like part of the building community, you know, it's, uh, you don't want to do this alone. I personally don't, you know, and, and I'm a result of a lot of people helping me out. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, what do you recommend for us, um, uh, rising business leaders to get comfortable being visible and sharing our various identities in the workplace? You know, uh, that just depends on the personality. Uh, there's a lot of introverts out there. They love, you know, doing their work behind a desk and it's part, and that's why they're succeed, succeeding. But like more in war, you have to put yourself out there and then it's, you know, figure out a way to, to make that less uncomfortable if you're that one of those introverts. But, you know, it's talk to people, network. But one of the things that I don't like about networking is that it can be very transactional. And one of the things that I've learned throughout my career uh, in order to be more visible, to create a community, to be a leader, is to sort of pick quality over quantity. And also, you know, like, for example, the break into my first TV job was I had met this writer um, that was working for the for the show for the American Crime at a panel. I got his info, got his Facebook, but I didn't bother him like, you know, to pick his brain to get to, to invite him to copy because people are really busy you know they know what you want they know they want to build a connection with you like the coffee to pick your brain it's not a, such a great idea find ways to like get close to that person without stalking them i know he was teaching a class i took his class i didn't probably need to take his class but i took his class he got to know me and as a result he sent my materials to abc and as a result i got a job so it's like it's a little bit of extra work but at the same time you build friends you build relationships and that's really really important i he's one of those mentors now i call him my padrino my literary godfather because he really ushered me in and you know he loves it all latinos love to be called padrinos i mean <laughs> i guarantee it it works every time i was like hey padrino i mean he's like just a couple of years younger, older than me but he just just melts every time so Figure out a way to build those relationships without, you know, coming across as transactional and you'll be, you'll be fine. Yeah. And it goes back to authenticity and love and just, you know, just, you know, strive for, for, for excellence. Um, there's, there's an interesting one here and I don't know what it means. Maybe you do is this, have you visited Oklahoma, the Hollywood of the Midwest? No, I have not had the pleasure <laughs> of Oklahoma, but I'd be happy to, I hear that a lot of productions are being there. I don't know, is there a yeah. tax incentive that is happening there? Why, you know, so maybe in the future, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the one hope or piece of wisdom you have for the LGBTQ plus and or the immigrant community? I think that we're in a place where, yes, we're still fighting for our rights. We're still fighting for visibility. And sometimes it's very difficult to come out to our parents and our families that are Latino or with specific culture that just tr tries to keep you away. But just don't give up on yourself. You know, I really don't find your tribe, find that community that, you know, can support you, find your little group you know, to your second family to, to make it through because you have no idea when you stand in front of an audience or a panel or whatever, how you are affecting, you know, people that need that courage to keep on going. And I've had numerous people come to me years later after a panel or something like, you know what, your story resonated with me. And I'm glad that you are very authentic with who you are because it allows me to be authentic with who I am at meetings and interviews. And that's really, really important to be able to see that there's someone, you know, that's taking that path and maybe take a couple of sort of like tips from that. And, and, I, and, and to me, like, that's the best you could do, you know, like just don't give up on yourself. We are full 
full of full of magic, you know. So it's, it's, <laughs> the world needs to see it, and 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 a couple of other cultures like LGBT people were considered like magical spirits, you know. Yeah. So I'm gonna take that, um, and I've taken that, and and I'm not shying away from that. But I'm not saying it's not hard. Um, yeah. But that's why you need your community, your group of people to, to also cheer you on. Yeah. Well, listen, I know we're, we're out of time here, but on behalf of Bank of America, um, you know, and, you know, everyone here, and it's been a pleasure getting to know um, you, getting to know your story, getting to know how you created one of my favorite, uh, you know, stories about one of my favorite, um, you know, um, singers of all time. And it's been an honor. So I just um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing and looking forward to seeing what else you, you, you uh, share with the world. Thank you, everyone. I, I just, I love this interview. It was fast, but uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to move into the uh, the lounges where we're going to do a little bit of networking. Um, and then, Moises, I think we're just going to let you go probably do something else that's, you know, that's very creative and we want to keep you, um, you know, um, on, on task. So, so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Much love to everyone. Yeah.